Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we were doing part 7, I believe, of our Planet Zoo mod showcase, and I know some people have been asking for this, and considering we got that new DLC coming, and I'll do the reaction after this video, it's pretty interesting, um, I've been a lot of, I've got like four videos I need to do on this, along with the Prehistoric Kingdom videos, so I think we're going to be chock a flock of videos, chock a blocker with videos in the next few days. A few, even the weeks even. So let's get into it. We are going to have a look at our first animal. We are going to have a look at the Malayan tapir. So the Malayan tapir is really really cool. So also called the Asian tapir or the piebald tapir. It's the only tapir that lives now that's native to the old world. The other tapir species are from South America, which is really weird because they didn't evolve anywhere near there. We know that tapirs lived in North America as well, as recently as like 10,000 years ago. And there was a giant tapir that lived in China until about 4,000 years ago. So it's kind of just a really recent uh, weird uh, hodgepodge of different habitats that these guys are living in. So these guys are really easy to tell from other tapirs because of this big big white mark on their back along with the black uh, face and legs kind of like a reverse panda and uh it's covered in black hair along their tips of ears and stuff and they get pretty big i believe they're the largest species of tapir they get between 1.8 and 2.5 meters uh in length and get to about 100 uh, three foot seven feet tall uh, three Three feet seven inches, yeah, and get between 250 and 350 kilograms. And like other tapir species, they have this very, very flexible proboscis that they use to grab, uh, browse, and eat because they're very cool. So these guys uh, kind of just go around the Malaysia and they live in Sumatra as well. Just go around browsing what they can, and they have pretty poor vision, so you got to be very careful with. Uh, going around them and trying to well, if if you are in Sumatra or Malaysia of course you, you gotta be careful so the gestation period for a female Malayan tapir is about 390 395 days so a little over a year with one offspring being born and it's the cutest offspring they have these really cute little uh, bands on them to help camouflage them in the dimmed light of the rainforest and they're primarily too solitary they have like a uh, territories that they maintain and even though they're herbivorous they kind of feed on all sorts of different plants just really whatever to the forest and just use uh, scent marking to make sure that everyone knows this is their turf and to leave them alone and look at them run so yeah these guys are found southeast asia rainforests and uh, there were populations in borneo that may have persisted recently but are believed to gone extinct Current populations are doing okay, but they're very, very uh, susceptible to deforestation and the illegal uh, pet trade. Oh, well, not the pet trade, but the illegal trade of them, similar to how uh, tigers are. So, yeah, and they're very, very susceptible to things like that. So, yeah, they're doing fine okay now, but they are endangered, so they're being monitored and... Obviously, a lot of animals in Southeast Asia are endangered because of deforestation, but yeah, a really cool little guy, quite like him. And now we get to move on to the next animal. We have got, this has to be one of my favorites, it's really, really cool. This is the Vizant, or the European Bison. So this guy is uh, the other species of extended bison, this is the compared to the American bison. These guys are the heaviest land animal in Europe and uh, pretty much died out, or almost died out. It was a really sad story. It's been hunted into antiquity like uh, in the uh, Middle Ages and stuff and eventually at the turn of the 20th century there was only 12 left alive. And these were taken into zoos, so these were bred and they had a ma massive stud book which they use to track the genealogy and what animal is bred from who and whose sister is who and things like that. So to make sure you prevent as much in prevent as much inbreeding as possible, especially from a small population. So now that it has rebounded to some, some extent, they're considered near threatened now, which is really good, even though their population has gone from twelve 
to as of now about 7,000 that live in some areas there's some that live in like the Carpathian Mountains they've been some have been released back into the wild and become parts of the natural ecosystem again which is pretty cool so yeah these guys live pretty much all around Europe we can stop find them Poland uh, Romania even Russia as well in the the prehistoric range or historic range was also like pretty much into Central Asia so these were quite animals big animals that lived, had quite a big range so these guys are pretty much a little bit smaller than their cousins they're a little bit lankier but they're a bit taller they can get two meters tall at the shoulder and they can weigh up to about uh, for for males they can get to uh, 920 kilograms so almost a ton so they're quite big animals these these are the replace the female so they're not quite as big but I would love to see why in the game they get very very big see so yeah, I just mentioned the, the history of them the, that's a really sad story but it's a really great conservation story in my opinion because we just went down from 12 and now we have got 7,000 due to people that cared and people that want these animals back on the landscape I think that's pretty cool so they live in smaller herds they don't live in huge herds like bison do uh, American bison do they live in smaller herds and live around woodland forests and even clear forests. They have a very, very important roles in their ecosystems. They help maintain mosaic habitats, which is why We Wild in Europe has been really pioneering getting these animals back into the landscape so they can function that and provide ha habitats for both species that like open areas and forests. So they kind of create a mosaic that boosts biodiversity. And they usually breed rushing around from August through October. And bulls about four or six years old may stop may not mate because of older bulls and what's cute is the average male calves can wear about 27 kgs and a female 24 and they keep on growing about six years until they reach their adult size and can live for as long as 30 years in captivity but their wild lifespans is usually between 18 and 24 the females live a little bit longer and these guys eat whatever there is they eat browse and shoots they're a lot more generalist than uh, American bison. American bison primarily eat grass. These guys will eat browse and grass. And yeah, it's really awesome to see how well these animals are doing. There's been herds released into. Uh, there was even a bison in Siberia. There was a couple of bison released into Pleistocene Park. So yeah, I just really like these guys. Wonderful, wonderful, and a good mod too. I really like it. That's one animal I like to see in the game. Even though it's all oh, to clone all. <laughs> I think it's cool. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next animal. We've got another uh, Asian animal. We've got, we've got the Chinese alligator. So, the Chinese alligator is obviously a close relative of the American alligator. Also known as the Yangtze alligator. Is a... Uh, Oh, quite a bit smaller than the uh, American alligator. They get up to about 1.5 to 2.1 meters long and weigh between 36 and 45 kilograms. Uh, they broodmate in burrows in the winter and are opt optimistic feeders, so they pretty much eat whatever they can, similar to American ones. And they're much more endangered. The issue is, is that there is a lot of them in captivity. There's about 20,000 in captivity, but only 500 living in the wild because of uh, pollution and deforestation. So. They kind of just preserve them in, especially the Yangtze. The Yangtze is a very polluted river. If you've heard the story of the Baji and the fi uh, finless porpoises, that's a big issue. So yeah, these guys uh, dig burrows. The life they usually breed around early summer, where the, the rate of rain becomes highest in mid-July. And then they obviously uh, have sex de temperature sex determination, which means that if the temperatures are different, uh, that means you get more males or females, it kind of balances out. That's another big issue with uh, climate change, because if on average you get higher temperatures, that means you're going to get more of one sex, which means that there's going to be a bit imbalance in the sex ratios within the populations, and that means they're at higher risk of extinction, and higher risk of getting inbred. And these guys are really cool because they'll make pretty vocal. They make many different sounds, similar to like American alligators. They make deep bellows and things like that. It's really, really cool. 
And these guys live around wetlands and pools, and they lake around subtropical and tropical climates. They live at the base of mountains and things like that. Very, very cool. Though it seems here yeah, they're doing pretty well in uh, captivity as of 2016. At least 20,000 Chinese alligators live in captivity. But only about 500 or so are living in the wild. So what happens is we could just release them, but they, there isn't really much habitat for them right now that's like ready for them to live. And they live in a bunch of zoos around the world. Like uh, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, San Diego. Yeah, but a really cool mod too. It's just... A, even looks like a little caiman. Caiman worked out perfectly. So yeah. We're on to our next animal now. Let's see what the next animal is. We have got... The dwarf cassowary. With some cute babies. Look at that. Very, very cute. This is the dwarf cassowary. So dwarf cassowary, also known as the little cassowary or the mountain cassowary, is a close relative of obviously the southern cassowary, which is already in the game. So these guys are obviously smaller, and these guys live in the highlands of New Guinea, so not too well studied. It. So they they are still pretty large though. They're slightly smaller. They get to about 150 centimeters uh, long and weigh between 15 and uh, 17 and 26 kilos. That's still a pretty big animal, if I do say so myself. So compared to other cassowaries, it's sh uh, shorter with the uh, Slightly smaller bill and all that. Wow. And like other cassowaries, they feed on fruit and fallen fruits and pick from shrubs, even small animals and insects. Just don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> and then um, they kind of eat what they can. And they pair during the breeding season and usually migrates. They migrate to parts of their range. You can see the smaller ones, the male, and the larger ones, the female. That happens in a lot of ratites. Oh. Can you watch them? What are they gonna do? Mm -hmm. That's cool. So these guys are classed as near threatened and could be. Uh, at risk of habitat loss, since obviously a lot of rainforests in the world are at risk of that because of people chopping it down. But they have been downgraded least concern as they appear to be stable and uh, there's not as much hunting pressure as there was. So they're doing more okay than before. Still cool animals nonetheless. So this is the female I believe. I love cassowaries, they're such cool animals. Look at the babies, look at the babies. Look at them go. What a cutie. It's awesome. I love these guys. So let's get to the new animals. Next animal, next animal. We have got, look at this, we have got the... Proboscis monkey, which is one of my favorite monkeys. And the largest. At least one of the largest. So this is the proboscis monkey that lives in the old world. It's endemic to the Southeast Asian island of Borneo and found in mangrove forests and coastal areas. There's, uh, these guys are pretty large. They're the largest monkey species in Asia. They can get to about uh, 66 to 72 centimeters in the head to body length. And they can weigh to about 16 to 22 kilos, which is a maximum weight of 30 kilos. So that's pretty big. That's 30 kilos. If you pick up 30 kilos, it tells you how heavy they are. Females measure, uh, female measure 53 to 62 uh, centimeters in head to body length and weigh between 7 and 12 kilograms, slightly smaller. And the further where the issue is that if you look at these guys, they have these big bulbous noses. And that's for sexual selection because they can make loud vocalizations. And they are still really weird primates. I think they're just funny. And they got this really nice colored fur. You can see it's like a brick red and all that. Pretty, pretty cool. So these guys live in groups consisting of one adult male, some adult females, and the offspring. So there's also bachelor groups. They live in what's called the fusion fission society, which means the animals mix and match. Just like uh, things like elephants do. And it's pretty cool. They reach sexually mature at about five, and they... Uh, 
often it's mate between February and November with births, births happening in May. And these guys make various vocalizations, of course. They make like hoots and honks, and <laughs> I like honks in a serious term. And they can kind of communicate with each other. Very, very cool. You're just pondering there, I might find another one. So these guys are placed in Tibetan, no, not Tibetan, no. Japanese mechanic. Pretty cool boy. So I mentioned that these guys can be found in Borneo and uh, they live in mangrove forests and swamps and even live with orangutans as well. They kind of eat what they can really, they eat like around 55 different species of plants that they observe feeding on. They also use to prefer, uh, prefer young leaves as they tend to be, uh, and you prefer unripe fruits over ripe fruits so they have certain purposes. It kind of just eats whatever's available. And they obviously are prey for different species, including crocodiles, cow leopards, eagles, monitor lizards, and pythons. So yeah, these guys are considered endangered because their total population has decreased by half in the last 40 years. And due to ongoing habitat loss like other Southeast Asian animals like logging and such. So it's very, very sad. The largest population can be found in Panamala and uh, Bondi. So, the proboscis monkey is protected by law at least, but they are still obviously poached like a lot of Southeast Asian animals. But yeah, these guys seem to be doing okay-ish now. So we don't have to worry about these wonderful guys. Such cool monkeys. Okay, so now let's move on to the next animal. Now, we're starting to get into extinct animals. Wouldn't you like that? Who doesn't love extinct animals? So now we are moving on to... Well, this is Icachelis, or Icadelis, or how we pronounce it. This is a species of giant penguin from uh, late Eocene of uh, South America, so between 37 and 33 million years ago. So these guys stand about 1.5 meters tall, so they're quite a bit taller than modern uh, king or emperor penguins. And they are not really, there were lots of giant penguins back in antiquity, so these guys are not actually the largest, but they're still a giant penguin. These guys were found in Peru by a team led by Dr. Julia Clark from North Carolina State University. And what's really interesting is these guys, we know their, their colors. There's a, I believe this is a species, but they are found to have lived around all these latitudes uh, even almost to the, because at the time it would have been a little bit more uh, different latitude than it is now. So they may be living almost to warmer waters, almost to the equator. They never really passed the equator, but they lived in warmer waters than most penguins, because most penguins today live around New Zealand and Antarctica. So the discovery of this has really changed how people have seen penguins, so that makes it pretty cool. Now I believe this, or a different species, we actually know the colors of. So this is based off a related species, I believe. I'm not sure this is the exact species that has the colors of. But yeah, we have a species of penguin that we know the colors of. And it had this, like, orange, like this here. It's really, really cool. Now that looks pretty cool. And let's just watch them swim for a bit. Right? Man, I love Planet Zoo. This game's great. This game's incredible. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Am I gonna die? Yeah, just seeing animals dive is awesome. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done with you. Time to move on to the next animal. So we have got Panthera Onca Augusta. And you know what that means? That is the giant Pleistocene jaguar. So this is an extinct subspecies of your normal average jaguar. 
And then these guys lived around... These guys only became extinct around 10, 11,000 years ago. If they were a little bit bigger, they were a little bit lankier. They were more adapted to open areas since America was a little bit more open. And these guys lived to about 11,000 years ago and got a little bit larger. So these guys have been found in Washington, Tennessee, uh, Oregon, uh, and kind of all those areas in Pennsylvania to Florida. So these guys are really not that different, but the I think a lot of people think the jaguars that lived in the 1800s are these species. Now they're just they became extinct, and then South American jaguars, the ones that we know today, came up and took over their uh, place. So yeah, this is really cool. It's also a size mod as well. I think this is awesome. We get an extinct jaguar. It's not different, too different from today's Jaguar. It's only a subspecies, which means there isn't too much difference between them. And I'm going to show this found a melanistic one, so to show it off. I think that looks wonderful. Incredible, even. Incredible, even. So yeah, and then we'll have a look at our little little cubbies. Look at this little guy. He was very, very cute. So we can see the changes. A lot of the changes in sizes. So they're slightly larger than modern day uh, uh, jaguars, which are the third largest big cat after lions and tigers. So, yeah, well, tigers are the largest, and then lions, and then jaguars. But, yeah, these guys are cool. Really, really cool. And now, speaking of lions, what a great segue. We have got the American lion. So this is... Panthera Aatrox, or the American Lion. This guy lived in North America, evolved from the cave lion about 340,000 years ago and became extinct only 10,000 years ago, along with the other Pleistocene megafauna in North America. So, they get a, they're actually quite big too. They get about 25% uh, larger than modern lions. They get around like 350 kilos, so that's very, very, very big wonderful male looking on here oh, that's cool so there was a lot of debate about whether these guys were actually jaguar related to jaguars but the mitochondrial dna found in some of these bones suggests that they are a sister lineage to cave lions and descended from a population that made their way into america about 300,000 years ago which is pretty cool so these guys are huge they get to about May have measured to about 1.6 to 2.5 meters, or 5 foot 3 to 8 foot 2 from the tip of the snout to the base of the tail, and stood 1.2 meters, or 3.9 foot at the shoulder. It was smaller than the short-faced bear, and compare, uh, literally uh, larger than Spilodon fetalis, which was the smaller species of uh, saber-toothed cat, at about 280 kilos. These guys have estimated to have weighed about 420 kilos maximum. And the average weight may have been 254, uh, 256 average for males and 351 for a large female. So their size estimates range quite a bit, but they were definitely heavier than Smilodon fetalis at the uh, the species of saber-toothed cat they lived with, and may have niche partitioned with them. While these guys were living out in the grasslands, and it's really mosaic habitat. So these guys were living out in the open plains and stuff compared to the smaller dog that was living in closed forests. So yeah, these guys pretty much ranged from all over America, or southeast, like from Mexico and up to around Ohio and stuff like that, where the uh, glaciers cut off. And they would have changed uh, depending how the glaciers melted and such. So yeah, these guys obviously very common in the tar pits. And these guys pretty much just ate what they could. They likely preyed on deers, horses, camels, tapirs, uh, bison, mammoths, and other large ungulates. And there's evidence of hunting on even uh, blue babe, which is a steppe buffalo, or steppe bison technically. And these are really, really cool. And you can see this is the male here, the female. You can see their different proportions. They're like a, quite a bit lankier than normal lions. They got a longer face. You can see the difference in proportions to these lions versus, uh, um, I really like this mod actually, I really like this, this is Panthera Aatrox, remember the American lion, and you can see the difference in proportions, longer face, 
longer legs. Kind of lanky, but also huge at the same time. It's really weird. But yeah, and then we'll have a look at a cub. Hello, cub. Hello, cub. Hello, cutie. It's awesome. I really like this mod. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Incredible, even. So, yeah. Now, we get to move to our last animal. Another, another American extinct giant. We have got the... Oh, there's a bit doing in here, though. We've got the Colombian Mammoth. And who doesn't love the Colombian Mammoth? So the Colombian Mammoth lived around North America. Uh, as recent as 11,000 years ago. And there was a recent study on these guys that showed that the ancestors of Colombian Mammoths interbred with Steppe Mammoths and ancestral woolly mammoths. And these guys are a hybrid population. This is a pretty recent study, so that's really, really cool. And they're huge too. Look at these big boys. So yeah. These guys get to about 4 meters tall or 13 feet tall. A little bit bigger than African elephants. And up to 10 tons in weight. We're one of the largest mammoth species. These guys lived in all sorts of different habitats around like parklands, around the United States, even down south as Mexico, and interbred with woolly mammoths in, their, in the northern part of their range. You can see this cool dome shape they have, they just look nice. And yeah, they're pretty, pretty awesome. So these guys are obviously, uh, we don't know how much hair they had, so it's very likely that they weren't as hairy because they were living in warmer places, even though it was a lot winter. And uh, these guys obviously lived a lot like modern elephants, as evidence from uh, the tarpits, because the tarpits usually only has young bulls or old bulls, since they don't really have the social group to try and keep them from going out. So we know that they sort of lived more, sort of like modern elephants in a lot of ways. And they use their tusks. We even have a preserved specimen of these guys with their tusks locked. Shows that they were using them to fight for whatever, to dominance of females. Which is, that's pretty cool. Wonder, wonderful animal. So yeah, these, we have dozens of specimens. Dozens and dozens and dozens of specimens. So these guys came to the Americas about a million years ago. And split off from step mammoths and these guys were just eating as much as they could they needed to eat about 180 kilos of food per day to survive and forage for 20 hours a day so they and isotope studies show that they diet varied a lot from location so a mix of c3 which is most plants and c4 which includes grasses and we're not restricted to either which were woolly mammoths were much more restricted to grazing because that was really all there was on the mammoth step so these guys were much more generalist in their terms of their uh, diet. These guys were also thought to may have lived up to 80 years. So these guys may have been very, very long-lived giants. And they reached the and male elephants grew to about 40 years old, while females about 25. And they have a gestation period of 21 to 22 months, which is comparable to modern elephants. Of course. And these guys, we have a lot of evidence that they were hunted by humans as well. We can see, find uh, spare points and specimens and stuff. And it's a very sad story of their extinction. It was like, not likely just people. It was climate change that was happening at the time. It's a very multi-layered factors. The end Pleistocene extinction is very, very uh, controversial in a lot of ways. And there's lots of different ideas. But really, ultimately, it's probably... A, a case-by-case -case basis with individual species. Some species were, like, specifically animals in Australia were affected mostly by the climate because Australia was becoming more desertified, more desertified, which means that it was a lot more arid, so it became a lot more like it was today because it was a lot wetter about uh, 40,000 years ago than it is today. So it's a lot of habitat. Also hunting. Hunting probably almost affected things like uh, woolly mammoths and really, really big slow breeders like that. But yeah, this is a really, really wonderful mod. This really shows off the wonderful side of these animals. Look at that. I just love the elephants in this game. They just look so nice and the animations are just so lifelike. Planet Zoo really is a wonderful game. 
I can really not thank Frontier enough for making this game. And in DLC that I'll be doing a video on probably right after this one. So yeah, I'll put all the links to these mods in the description of course to all the people that made them. You've done a wonderful job. So yeah, I think now's a good time to end this video. So yeah, hopefully guys, you hopefully you guys like this video. If you guys like and subscribe, always remember to click that little bell icon in the corner to make sure you get notified whenever I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye.